hearing this message that you know a lot of the stuff you said this morning is actually going to be you know covered in the message. I want to start with reading a section from James, and it's in James four. Uh, I believe it's. 13 to 17. And it talks about boasting about tomorrow. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, <laughs> you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone, then, who knows the good thoughts to do and does not do it, sins. And that reminds us of our Bible study this morning, in a way. But we can correct these things. And I want to just read from Peter, and I think this is also found in, uh, in the book of Isaiah. And, and uh, I really like this section, and it parallels what we just said. All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And I think that's important to realize. You know, this world, with all its dazzling arrays and so on, you know, it really doesn't give us much hope when you come right down to it. You know, you can't pack your wallet when you're on your way to heaven. Well, what comes next is the title of this. And it reminds me, you know, I, I often quote... <clears throat> Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Or to put it another way, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, including you and I. So you may not think you belong to the Lord, but you do. Maybe you just don't recognize it. And everything that happens in this world, God knows. And what chose, I guess, why I chose this particular topic this morning and honestly, I think this could be a funeral message, too, at the same time. It was never intended to be. But I go into York Manor almost every day, and I sit with my wife, and I often talk to the staff, and I often talk to the visitors that are visiting their loved ones. And sometimes I engage them in conversation. And we know that places like, you know, long-term care, are basically God's waiting room. There's no question about it. You know, people come, people go. But they only go one way. And, and I had an interesting <clears throat> statistic on death, by the way. It says this. Statistics on death are very impressive. One out of one dies. You know? And then, I, I have a book here called Tale of the Ox Cart, and it's by Chuck Swindle, and I'll read you a couple more stories here in a minute. But what caused me to choose this is that when I talk to some folks, and Wendy knows this because I talked to, I didn't know it at the time, but remember when I was talking to uh, one of the folks there and I said, where do you find your hope? And I didn't realize that you were related. And the answer I got, I was astounded. Uh, you know, as many people as you ask, you're going to find a lot of different answers. But you know, unfortunately, I don't see a lot of people saying, I find my hope in the Lord. Plain and simple. The boys have to make life a lot easier there. <laughs> and so that's what caused me to, to choose this topic. But I do have another little story from Tale of the Ox Cart. <coughs> and it's by children. You know, ask most people about dying or heaven and you get amazing answers, especially from children. Here's a kid age seven. God doesn't tell you when you're going to die because he wants it to be a big surprise. <laughs> a kid named Aaron eight. The hospital is a place where you go on their way to heaven. Kid age 10. A good doctor can help you so you won't die. A bad doctor sends you to heaven. Uh, kid cause nine. Doctors help you so you won't die until you pay your bill. 
Uh, Marcia, age nine, when you die, you don't have to do homework in heaven unless your teacher is there. <laughs> have you been a teacher? <laughs> I'm not afraid to die because I'm a boy scout. When birds are ready to die, they just fly to heaven. Well, that's my topic this morning. And again, I don't mean to be morbid, but what the intent of this was, it's, it's a gospel message. And, you know, if you believe, that's great. But this message is directed so much more to people that aren't saved. And, you know, we're often told that in mixed company, we should avoid the topic as politics, sense, and re uh, sex, and religion. I've made that mistake many times. <laughs> and maybe so. And, and in religion, we often talk of a lot of things. We talk about dogma and a whole bunch of stuff. But one topic that's often skipped is the matter of death and dying, the exception being a funeral. If I shut my eyes and my ears to certain topics, they don't go away. If I shut my eyes, you're still here, and I'm still here. <laughs> Inevitably, every human being must come to grips with the idea of death. We're born to die. Christ himself was born with specific destiny of facing death and sacrifice, and he knew it. Men and women, man and woman, were originally created to live eternally with God on this earth. And also angelic beings were made to live eternally. Adam and Eve lived in the garden. The exact timelines, they're not really known. Some commentators think they lived there roughly 150 years. Whatever it is, it was a bit of time. But we can assume that. So Genesis 2, 15, 16 tells us, God put man in the garden to work and take care of it. They were free to eat from any tree, but were forbidden by God to not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, not if, but when, you will surely die. We often think the statement refers maybe to just a spiritual death, but it also refers <coughs> to physical death as well. Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and this way death came to all men because all sin. You know, when I was younger, before just maybe newly saved, and I was probably 50 years old, so that's at least five, six years ago. <laughs> and well, okay, maybe a little longer. But I thought, Adam, that's not my sin. No, why should his sin be put on me? And then, you know, when you start to think of it, oh, I never told the lie when I was a kid. I never took anything that wasn't mine, you know. And it really changed my mind very, very quickly. Sin in man's nature causes both physical and spiritual death. And not all religions believe this, by the way. And they have a variety of explanations for man's behavior. But my focus isn't on other religions. It's on what the Bible says about life and death. As a people in general, most fear death. It's often not a topic of discussion and is often <coughs> swept under the carpet. You know, think of, you know, when you go to a funeral, he's passed away. And all the euphemisms <coughs> that we have for people that are passing on, and passing on one of them too, you know. And, and our culture worships and zeroes in on youth. All you have to do is turn the TV on. You see a few older people, but they're all young. And, and you know, we all get older. And they forget about older people. It's almost to the point in politics, and I've heard this, that all our economic woes, you know, the hospitals and, you know, what do they call them, bed blockers and stuff like that, are caused by the elderly. And artificial intelligence today, which is big, isn't there a new phone coming out with AI? Well, forgive me, you know, I'm not a big fan. And, but, you know, it's trying to give eternal life to the human body. You know, think of the movie The Terminator or something like that. But you know something? Man's technology is not God's plan. And secular ideology is really opposed to the word of God. And if evolution were true, why wouldn't we evolve to live Three or four hundred years, why just 40 or 50 or 60 years? It doesn't make sense. Uh, evolution doesn't make a lot of sense when you look at it. 
But the Bible tells us how humans were formed and by whom, when they were created, and why they were created. And God gave that one rule for man to follow. But they broke faith with God and punishment followed swiftly. And herein is lies the problem. When Adam and Eve defiled God and defied God, in that day, everything changed. Satan had put doubt into the minds of Adam and Eve, and he said, did God really say, and by the way, he's still doing that today. <coughs> Eve did respond to the servant saying that they could eat from all the trees except the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not even touch it or you will die. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And the serpent who spurns God and who is opposed to God said to Adam and Eve, you will not die, and when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. And Adam and Eve ate the fruit. And you will notice that Eve added to God's word. God didn't say he couldn't touch it, but Eve said it. And you know, the Bible tells us, don't add or subtract the word. Don't go right. Don't go left. Keep a straight line. You know, so upon their eating, their eyes were open, you know, and uh, they realized they were naked. Now, I could go off on a tangent here. I heard a sermon on uh, Family Channel. I have Cyrus Radio in my car, and I heard a whole sermon on the word naked. But if we just look at it as, as a realization of the consciousness, the shame, that would be enough for the time being. So God pronounced judgment upon Adam and Eve and Satan and the world, the physical world too. And God said, by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Now, man's physical flesh is going to die. And if the Bible ended there on this note, then all possible future and hope God, we might as well just get up and leave and go home and watch TV. But God, the God with multiple chances, gave mankind a way to return to him. There was Mosaic law, but even more important, God gave his son as atonement for our sins. A new chance and a new birth and a new life. He gave it to mankind out of his grace and mercy, a gift of eternal life, chance and the opportunity to return to God and ultimately another chance to regain eternal life. But now, with sinful flesh, but not now with sinful flesh, but in the future we'll have a glorified body for eternity. And I'm kind of looking forward to that because I think knees are included in that. Or I sure hope they are. <laughs> you know, from about the end of Genesis 3.15, the rest of the Bible is Christocentric. It's about Christ. Or about Christ coming to seek and to save that which was lost. In effect, because of original sin or Adam's sin, man has inherited a sinful nation. We're born in sin. The law which ensued was a schoolmaster to show mankind's sinful nature. And it's even so today. Did you ever ask yourself uh, when Jesus was born, why he didn't have a human father? Do you ever think about that? The answer is simple, isn't it? Because we're born in sin. If we're born in sin, a human being could not be Jesus' father. It's that simple. Anyways, we've inherited that nature, whether we know it or not, but we have. And the Bible tells us in many and various ways that sinful man is doomed. The wages of sin is death. But in Hebrews 9, 27, 28, just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So we know that we're sinners, and we know that Christ died for our sins. John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And the world around us says, oh, man, that's a pretty stark statement. 
You're so narrow-minded. <laughs> Who do you think you are? You know? And, you know, it's discriminating. They don't like it. They're opposed to it. But this is God's claim. It's not mine. It's not man's. Wide is the road and narrow is the gate. Only a few find it. You know? The Bible tells us how and what must be done in order to refellowship and return to God. I want to read from Romans 10, 9 to 13. And I think I've got it here. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is probably a, a, a well-known passage. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Why do we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart? Why the two? Because they must become one. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call upon him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't it interesting sometimes when the Bible repeats something? Uh, it takes me a while to figure it out, but it's important. I want you to get the point. So, I don't know about you, but I'd like to have some sort of knowledge about my future and my eternal home. I don't want to be in the dark. God's word dispels any doubt. And God gives us a promise of eternal life through his son, and all believers must stand on this promise. As we live and breathe in our flesh, our earthly bodies, we'll age, and there'll be breakdowns and aches and pains and diseases. And as we age physically and mentally, we'll have limitations. And if you don't believe me, look in front of you, look behind you. If you have a mirror, check it out. We're all aging. You know, I'm sorry. We're not going backwards, unfortunately. And the oil of lay ain't going to help you. So, it's all part and parcel of growing older. And sometimes it's not all that pleasant, for sure. But it does give us limitations. And it's hard to deal with sometimes. But the hope that we have in Christ gives us a belief. It gives the believer a glimpse into their future. Revelation 21, 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Jesus, just as Christ Jesus rose from the dead in his human body, then had a glorified body, never to die again. He's the first fruit. To return to the Father for eternity. We also have that promise. 1 Corinthians 5. Or 1554. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal and the immortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. It's natural to grieve over the death of people. In the story of Lazarus, after Lazarus <coughs> dead, it was about four or five days to before, and Jesus came to Bethany, he saw Martha and the family weeping. And Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And Jesus also wept. But Jesus' display of emotion was not for the dead man of Lazarus. It was for the family and friends of Lazarus because of their hurt. And at this point, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And that's the quote. Psalm 24.1, I mentioned it before. Don't forget who owns everything in this world. <clears throat> we should be like Martha in that story when she said, I know he, meaning Lazarus, will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Martha continues saying, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into this world. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that God exists, and I think that's in Hebrews. You've got to believe God exists. It's essential. Faith is the doorway to knowing God and his son. As we live in this life down here that God has given us, we go towards our physical death in this life. But our physical death is actually a doorway for eternal life with God. 
Just as life is a state of being, so is death a state, and also the passageway to this new life. And you know, one reason I got Pat to read that scripture, and I know there's some controversy, but it said, you know, and he was taken away. Uh, I look at that as a type of rapture. You know, I know other theologians might not think so. But if, you know, if you don't believe the rapture, well, there's pretty good cause to believe it. Uh, the Bible tells us this. And the old song goes, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And you know, these days I seem to be passing a lot quicker than I did a few years ago. So knowing all this, how would you answer the question, what's death? What do you think happens after you die? Just as Jesus wept at Lazarus' death, so people do so with their friends. And you know, in this church alone, we've lost so many people, and they were our friends, but we'll see them again. And uh, you know, just as Jesus was resurrected from the de dead, never to die, the first fruit of the dead, what was the reaction of the people to this? You know, his disciples. Before and during the crucifixion, the disciples and others were scared, they were afraid, they were doubting, they were lost, they were divisive, they were hiding, they were fearful. I don't think they really understood 100% what was going on. But after the resurrection, joy, peace, amazement, belief, expulsion of doubt. And he opened their eyes, the Bible says, so that they could understand the scriptures. There was elation, there was truth, there was life. In Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit entered and filled the believers, they became invigorated and animated. So much so, people, that in Jerusalem they thought they were drunk. What was it, 9 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> Certainly, this change in Jesus' followers was so astounding that people took notice of this. Because of the changes, everything changed. You know, the whole tone and atmosphere of a lot of people and their existence changed. This changed before Christ and after Christ. And isn't it, you know, there's a movement on right now. Uh, B.C., I was taught, was before Christ. Now, what is it now? Before the common era. Yeah. You know, heaven forbid. And A.D., Anno Domino, after the death of Christ, you know, they've changed it. They're trying to take Christ out of everything that's worldly. Anyways, I think I've lost my place. <laughs> Uh, the, you know, the change <coughs> was there. And just as the disciples changed, we can change. We can become a new creation. I know we sort of talked about this this morning a little in the Bible study. There's always a little bit of flesh left in us. And if we lose our temper or we get mad at somebody, we tend to regress just a little bit. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to exhibit and rejoice and show joy when you're angry. And we have to watch ourselves. But death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is thy sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he has given the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This victory belongs to anyone who has, been, who has invited the Lord Jesus into their lives. Even the lost church, the lost church of Laodicea. Christ is standing at the door. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And he says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, you've got to do something. He said, I'll come in and I'll sup with you and you'll sup with me. What an invitation. Mm -hmm. After this, I looked up and there was a door standing in heaven. And you know, it's an interesting concept. The idea of doors in the Bible. Let's go back. Uh, heaven has a doorway, and it's all this open. John 10, 9, uh, 10, 9. Jesus said, I'm the gate or the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. In short, from Genesis to the ark, how many doorways were, was there in the ark? One. That was it. If you didn't get in that door, you better learn to swim. Anyways, it's it's just so astounding, that, that idea of the door. Now, have you entered that door? Or will that door be shut in your face for eternity? The choice is yours. And I, and I know sometimes we're preaching to the choir, but I'm hoping other people watching 
will take this message and take it to heart. Sure. Because it's the most important decision mm -hmm. you'll ever make in your life. Mm -hmm. It may not seem so, but the choice is yours. And you don't want to refuse that open door. Again, when someone asks about death and dying, the answer you give will indicate what you believe. God's word gives only a few glimpses into heaven, but each reference is full and rich, and we cannot imagine what God has in store for us. I have this picture in my head. I'm going to have a farm. I'm going to have my German shepherds and all my animals. And it's just like, remember Dick and Jane? <laughs> That's one of my visions. And I hope it's so you know. But who knows, eh? On the other hand, those who fail to enter into God's door are destined for everlasting separation from God and his glory. And in fact, the Bible describes more about hell than it does about heaven. In this world we live, you know, what constitutes truth and reality? Is there a God or not? Are there many ways to God in some religions? Realize just what the Pope said. All religions lead to God. And guess who agrees with him? Rick Warren. Well, I got news for him. He's got to read that Bible. You know, and some people even say today, I'm God. And you know, one of the biggest enemies in the United States is Oprah Winfrey. She has her own uh, visions of what God should be. So there's so many weird and wonderful theories out there. But there's only one answer that comes in the Word of God. Talk to people and you get a multitude of answers to the God and death and so on and so forth. And the biggest and most important decision of your life <coughs> is to invite Christ into your life so you become a new creation. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the only God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And yes, the world will look at you, and they'll judge you, and they'll say you're narrow-minded, you're intolerant, and a host of other negative labels they'll give you. But ironically, it's a compliment when you come right down to it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Proverbs 1.7 the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. And as we end, I get a note from Solomon. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment. This is kind of scary. <laughs> Including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. May God bless his word. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, we're going to end.